Hi everybody, my name is Curtis Mitch. I'm with the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology and welcome back to another reflection on today's Mass readings. Today is a wonderful Monday, May 24th, and today's a special day in the church. It's the memorial of Mary, the mother of the church. And not surprisingly, our gospel features today Mary being made the mother of the church by Jesus on the cross. That gospel comes to us from the gospel of John, chapter 19, verses 25 to 34. Now, today's gospel essentially brings us to the foot of the cross, where Jesus is experiencing the last hours and minutes of his earthly life. Jesus is dying, but we see that Jesus is not dying alone. He's surrounded by enemies on the one hand, but he's also surrounded by family and friends and some of his followers on the other. And in today's reading, there are really three momentous events that take place in this very short span of time, these last minutes of Jesus' life. The first thing is that Jesus entrusts his mother to the Apostle John, and that's really what we're going to focus on. Jesus, after that, accepts an offering of sour wine, and after which he, he assumes that his ministry is now complete. He says, it is finished once he takes that final sip of wine. And then thirdly, Jesus is pierced by a lance. And John, who was standing at the foot of the cross, remembers that both blood and water came pouring out of the Lord's side. Now, because of our time constraints here, we're just going to focus in on those words that Jesus speaks to Mary and the Apostle John, to his mother, what he does to, to ensure her care for the future. So let's read the passage and let's try to get into some of what's going on here. This is John chapter 19, beginning in verse 25. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And when he said to the disciple, Behold your, your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A bowl full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, in order to prevent the bodies from remaining on the cross, on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once there came out blood and water. All right, so what is going on in today's gospel? Well, you will often find and hear with respect to the gospel of John that there's often a surface meaning to the gospel passage, like a basic meaning that pretty much comes, comes easily to anyone who's reading it. It's sort of very close to the surface, but then there's something else. There's often something below the surface. There's often a deeper meaning. So what we're going to do here is try to see what's being said here on the surface, and then let's try to tunnel down into some of that deeper meaning. All right. So first, what's going on on the surface? What's the basic meaning? Jesus is hanging on the cross. He's gasping for breath. He's nearing death. And he is surrounded by a number of people. There are more than eight people there, but John in his gospel focuses on eight, right? He focuses on there are four soldiers at the foot of the cross. There are three women at the foot of the cross. And there's one apostle. Now, we know from the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke that there are actually more people than this, right? This is just a, a little telescopic view of some of those who are there. And of course, conspicuous by their absence is the fact that the other 10 apostles have already abandoned Jesus. They're not here. 
John and John alone has followed the Via Dolorosa all the way to its bitter end. He has followed, he has followed his master all the way to the cross. But of these eight people who are at the foot of the cross, Jesus only speaks to two of them, two of them directly. He speaks to his mother, whom he addresses as woman, and he speaks to John the apostle, whom he calls the beloved disciple. And it's interesting because in God's, uh, in John's gospel, neither Mary nor John are ever named Mary or John. They're simply referred to Jesus addresses his mother as woman. We'll see why that's significant. And John as the beloved disciple. Now, what Jesus is doing here is he is arranging for the care of his mother. Jesus has reached the very end of his life. He has been dispossessed of every last thing that he has. Even has his clothing has been torn off of him. And you remember the soldiers rip it up into four pieces, right? So he literally has nothing left but his earthly mother. All right, and so Jesus wants to take this final opportunity to ensure that his mother is cared for after he expires. But what Jesus says from the cross, woman, behold your son, and he tells John, behold your mother, this is more than just a dying wish on Jesus's part. There are biblical scholars who have shown that what Jesus is saying is basically the legal equivalent of a last will and testament. This is a binding, a legally binding act that Jesus is that Jesus is undertaking here. All right, that an executed criminal could in fact dispose of their belongings. They could bequeath whatever they had, whatever assets they had to those that they loved, to their family and friends at this very last moment as they were dying. And so as Jesus entrusts his mother to John the apostle, he's making John her protector, her provider. John is going to fill the role then of the pious son who welcomes Mary into his household and makes Mary part of his family. All right. Now, if you think about it, that this implies something. It's not directly stated, but it is implied. And that is, it's implied that Jesus has no other family, uh, has no other brothers or sisters who could assume that responsibility of caring for his mother. In other words, he had no other siblings, okay? This is, a, this is an important thing because Catholic teaching is precisely that, that even though the Gospels refer to the brothers and sisters of Jesus, they are never referred to as the sons and daughters of Mary, all right? These individuals, it's possible they could be children of Joseph from a previous marriage, but more likely they are Jesus's cousins. That's sort of the predominant tradition um, in, in the Catholic Church, at least since the time of St. Jerome. And so Mary here is portrayed not only as a widow, because St. Joseph had presumably died at some point before this episode, maybe even before the gospel stories themselves got underway, at least as far as Jesus' adult life is concerned. But she's not only a widow, but this implicitly helps to reinforce our faith in Mary as the ever virgin. Mary, who only ever had one son, and that's none other than the eternal Son of God. So that's basically what's going on on the surface, that you have Jesus uttering his last will and testament to take care, to make sure that, that his mother is well cared for after he is gone. But of course, this is the Gospel of John. So there's always something deeper going on. And what is that deeper thing? Well, Mary's relationship to John actually symbolizes in John's Gospel, Mary's relationship to the church. Okay, this is the hour of redemption. As Jesus is on the cross, he's bearing the sins of the world. He is paying the debts of our sin, right? And taking away the sins of the world because he is that lamb of God that uh, John the Baptist had spoken about at the beginning of the gospel. But in this hour of redemption, as Jesus is accomplishing this, new relationships are coming into being. 
throughout Jesus' ministry, he had been talking about all those who obey the Father's will are his brother and his mother and his sister. That there's a, a principle behind the family of God that transcends even natural biological ties of kinship. And so what's going on with Mary's motherhood here is that Mary's motherhood is being expanded, expanded in the order of grace. Mary is the natural, the biological mother of God the Son come in the flesh. So she's the mother of one son. But now that the hour of redemption has come, a new relationship is being created. Mary is being made the mother of John the beloved disciple. And the key thing to understand here in this passage is that as a number of biblical scholars will point out, is that the beloved disciple, on the one hand, it's an individual. It's John the Apostle, all right? But on the other hand, he's called the beloved disciple on purpose rather than seeing, being simply called, say, John, the son of Zebedee, or what have you. He's called the beloved disciple because he's more than an individual. He's also an icon. He stands for every disciple of Christ because every disciple of Christ is a beloved disciple. All right, and so John fulfills that symbolic role. And so by entrusting Mary to the beloved disciple, Jesus is entrusting Mary to the church, but is actually going on from there to make Mary the mother of the church by telling John, that beloved disciple, behold your mother. Jesus is making Mary the mother of all of his beloved disciples throughout history. All right. We actually see that later on in the New Testament in another book that this same author wrote. John the Evangelist is also traditionally identified as the author of the book of Revelation. And you'll remember from the book of Revelation chapter 12, that's that famous vision of the Blessed Mother uh, in crown, crowned with a, with a crown of 12 stars standing in the heavens and the moon under her feet and her garments are shining with the sun. And who is this woman? This is the woman who gives birth to the male child, the male child who was born with an iron rod in his hand. And who is that? Well, of course, it's Jesus Christ. It's the birth of Jesus that's being spoken of. But Jesus is being described in the language of, of Psalm 2 and some other Old Testament passages as the Davidic Messiah. So Mary, this mother, is a queen because her son is a king, the king of the Davidic line. But here's the key thing, and this is the important thing for today's reading, all right, is that Mary is more than just the mother of God the Son, more than just the mother of Jesus the Messiah. Because as this vision unfolds in Revelation 12, we are told that uh, the son is born, the son is caught up to heaven, he begins to reign over heaven and earth, and the angels uh, make war in heaven, the devil and his minions are driven out from heaven, then they are slammed down to earth. And then what happens? Verse 13 of Revelation 12 reads, And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to earth, he pursued the woman who had born the male child. Right? That's the mother of the Messiah. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle, that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness, to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. So, curious thing about this verse is that in early Christian iconography, it is universally attested that John, the author of the fourth gospel, is depicted in precisely this way. He is predicted, he's depicted rather as an eagle. And so here we have the woman who's the mother of the Messiah given protection by the wings of this great eagle. That might suggest a connection with the apostle John himself. But the really important thing comes in verse 17. Then the dragon was angry with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. All right. This woman who gave birth to the Messiah is not the mother only of the Messiah. She has other offspring. And how are they defined? Are they defined in biological terms? Are these children she has given birth to? No. These children are defined in spiritual terms. 
The rest of her offspring are defined as those who keep the commandments of God and bear testimony to Jesus. In other words, this woman, who is the mother of the Messiah, is also the mother of all the Christian faithful. All right, the entire church, the family of all of Jesus' beloved disciples have Mary, his mother, as their mother in the order of grace. And so when we, we hear the words of Jesus today from the cross, and he is saying, behold your mother to the apostle John, he's also, remember, speaking to me and you, because we are beloved disciples of Jesus as well. And Jesus is inviting us to take Mary into our own homes, right? He is, in fact, he's even entrusting us to Mary's care by making her our mother. All right, and so there's something profoundly relevant about what is going on here at these last moments of Jesus on the cross. There's a basic meaning, there's a surface meaning. Yes, he is ensuring her care going forward, but there's so much more than that in the Gospel of John, and there's more than that in this particular passage. Jesus is giving his mother to be the mother of the church, of all the faithful, of her offspring, those who keep the commandments of God and bear testimony to Jesus. Well, thanks for tuning in today. I pray that God blesses you, your family, and your day, and I look forward to seeing you here again next time. Thanks.